thanks. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Daniel and his colleagues for inviting me here. Uh, and I'd, of course, like to wish them their all success in the, uh, with their new center here. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, well, the title says it, and I apologize to my pure fear theorist friends here because I, I wanted to get into nuts and bolts so you can really see the kind of things we have to deal with and how we at least try to deal with the, the errors that come in. So rather than talking about algorithms, which of course are very useful, it's the focus is more on how we can do kind of uh, hardware fixes to, 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 to get around certain errors in, the, in, in our system. Uh, I think most of you know there's quantum computing is a big enterprise by now. This, I've just, I list here the groups throughout the world that are, that are just focusing on trapped atomic ions to try to do, to, to, to implement elements of quantum information processing. So it's certainly a very big enterprise by now. Um, so we, we actually got in the game fairly early and, and uh, just after Shor's algorithm uh, hit the airwaves and and uh, this was sort of our view early on around 1996. I mean, if we thought about some reasonable size factoring problem, uh, we might estimate it would take 10 to the ninth operations and several 10,000 qubits. And of course, here we were over here with a few qubits and uh, maybe 10 operations or so. And one of, the, one of the really nice things is, in some sense, the, the theorists we're able to uh, to do solve this gap between uh, between reality and and theory with the idea of error correction, and uh, they unfortunately we haven't done as good a job. Maybe in, over the last ten years we've gotten out here maybe another factor of five or so in terms of what our capabilities are. Uh, so we still have a long ways to go to do our share in closing this gap. Now, one thing, with the, one thing with the ions is that we, in some sense, we can uh, uh, satisfy the first five of David DiVincenzo's criteria to make a information processor. Uh, but that, in the same breath, we have to say, we, even though we can demonstrate the elements that he outlined, uh, we we need much better fidelity in the things that we do. So that. So what I'm going to try to talk about here is give you some idea of the technical problems we face and some ways around that. So I think most of you know the, the, the basic scheme with ions that was outlined by Serac and Zoller in 95. The, we will we'll choose some two levels in, a, in this case an atomic ion that ideally, of course, are pretty well protected from the environment. Uh, and their idea was if you could have, if you have this array of ions and you can think of this kind of like a pseudo molecule, if you can freeze out their motion with laser cooling, then you can take one of these modes of motion which can be spectrally isolated from the other modes and you can also form a qubit with that. And so the, the basic scheme they outlined uh, in their original proposal was if you could, if you, with a laser beam, if you could focus on, say, this ion here, and if you could map this, this superposition state into this selected motional mode qubit, then if you took another laser beam and uh, were able to perform a gate between the motional qubit and the internal state of that ion, then effectively you've done a gate between the two ions. So that, that was the basic scheme they laid out, and, and we can realize this just as that they laid it out. Uh, there's some more streamlined schemes, and I'll give you an idea how those work in just a second. Um, so the other thing is, well, we, we can try to make a choice uh, uh, of what transitions might, we might use. now. Reiner Blotz Group in Innsbruck has done you know, a really great job of, of using optical transitions uh, to, to do various demonstration experiments. And the one, the one problem that probably will, feel, though, yeah, I think they appreciate I mean, a, a little bit of problem with the optical transitions is that uh, for any reasonably allowed transition, you don't want it too weakly allowed, that is too long of a lifetime because then you start driving other transitions off resonance. So the typical decay times are about ten, uh, on the, can be on the order of a second, but that limits then the memory time. 
Probably more severe is the fact that the that uh, we need to control the phase of the radiation we use to drive the transitions relative to the ions. And the optical phase then, it's much harder to control the optical phase than if we used some other transitions, particularly hyperfine transitions that have energy separations on, rel rel uh, pardon me, corresponding to a microwave frequency. And so the relevant wavelength, which establishes these these phase errors is, is much easier to control. The other thing, because the the energy levels are, 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 are pardon me, the energy separation is fairly small. The, and for example, in hyperfine transitions, the, 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 the lifetime, the radiative lifetime is essentially infinite for all practical purposes. So, okay, so here's my, with apologies, here's my digression into the the dirty laundry, you might say. The, uh, to start off, I mean, of course, what we, we know what we want. We have our internal levels, which I'll represent, assuming the, the spin down state is, is zero energy. And then we, we have these motional modes, and we, since the ions are tightly coupled with the Coulomb interaction, we, we want to think about the, the normal modes of this kind of pseudomolecule. Well, it's easy to write down what we want. For example, if we use an electric dipole transition, then the, the, the interaction Hamiltonian for that is just basically the electric field uh, uh, dotted into the position of the optically active electron in the, in the, in the atom. Uh, so what I'm thinking here is you think about laser uh, transitions like the Innsbruck group do, does for, for the moment here. So, and we can write down the, 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 the electric field of the, of the laser, and of course it depends on the position, and this is how we get the coupling. This is the, say, the mean position of the ion, and this is the oscillations of the ion, of a particularly selected ion about, about its mean position. Uh, and we want to write this, these excursions of, of, of this j ion about its mean position in terms of its nor usual normal mode expansion. So if we do that, then we, I, I'm, I'm writing out, just, just expanding this in a little, little more complete fashion, uh, the, the expression on the last page. Uh, we get things like if we if we get out these terms. So if we write the cosine in terms of exponentials, the particular one we're interested if if for example the laser is tuned to the spin flip the in, the spin down spin up transition frequency minus the mode that we're interested in addressing, then that for example drives transitions here between in this particular example between this this spin down n equal two level to spin up n equal one, and where that term comes from is this, if we select out in this expansion of the exponential just the, the mode that corresponds to this, this, this omega k, the mode frequency of that particular mode, if we expand out this exponential, we, we, the, the first term in the expansion goes like this, and it, it's actually this term here that, that that's relevant for driving this transition. That is this lowering opera operator for this mode that we've spectrally selected and then the, 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 the raising operator for the internal states. Um, okay, so well, the problem, and that, that's the good part, and then but we have to think about all this, what all this other stuff means. And uh, so it, it starts to show the sensitivities that we have to worry about. So one is, uh, for example, just the, we have to be careful about the laser polarization since it, it, the polarization affects the, the, basically the transition matrix element. So we have to control that. Uh, an a, a important one, which is easy to talk about and, and we never do a, as good a job as we'd like is, is just the, the, the laser amplitude. So the, the electric field, which is of course related to the power, we, we never do a good enough just controlling the power. Another uh, s more subtle issue is the beam can be waving around a little bit, which affects the, the, the effective electric field inside the ion. The, the next thing uh, out of this list is a, we have the, basically this is the laser phase at the position of the ion. And there's two components. One is that this mean position of the ion could be moving around a little bit, and in fact it does. 
Uh, the other is that uh, the, 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 the phase of the laser itself uh, depends on the spectral purity of the laser, and that becomes an issue. This is why I said that it's probably it's more difficult to, to deal with optical transitions because this, this raw laser phase is much more difficult to control, at least in long term. Okay, so there's this there's this other part of the ex, the expansion of the of these position terms in the in the cosine kx uh, factors, and uh, although these are non-resonant, what they do is uh, all this mess here is effectively expresses the fact if the if the other modes are excited, then they kind of it then the, the position of the, of the ion is smeared out somewhat. And if we don't control that smearing out, that affects the, the transition rate. So also causes loss of fidelity. So the, anyway, the, uh, and then finally, uh, at least uh, in this, what these things summarize is that we, we're interested in this term here, which causes the transitions uh, between, these, uh, uh, between these selected levels I've shown here. But we have these higher order terms, and they act pretty much like this term here, is that they, they give a nonlinearity in this, in this excitation rate, which depends on the, the energy of, of that particular mode we're addressing. So ideally, what we like to do, of course, is freeze the motion out, cool every mode to the ground state, and implement these gates along the lines of, that Serac and Zoller showed. So this is the stuff we fight against uh, every day. And what the students and postdocs spend all their time is adjusting laser beams so that we can to suppress some of these problems. So I mentioned also that, that, that the one, one attraction is, uh, or one attractive scheme to think about is to go to hyperfine transitions in the electronic ground states. So this is, uh, now the energy separations are correspond to frequencies of gigahertz or a few gigahertz. And of course, we, we, we could use microwave to, to drive those transitions. Uh, the reason we use laser beams is that we get strong field gradients in the laser beams, which, which bring out those terms that I mentioned on the last view graph. Uh, and the, the other reason is, of course, we can get addressability with laser beams. So in this case, uh, the, to use hyperfine transitions, we, we think about driving two photon stimulated Raman transitions. So this is a two photon coherent process, which allows us to drive these transitions between the spin and uh, simultaneously between the spin and motional states. Uh, and of course, if we, uh, so the basic idea is if we, we have two laser beams separated in frequency by the transition we want to, uh, to, to drive. One of the technical advantages of doing it that way is that we can, we can take one laser beam and then frequently modulate it with a, with a, typically an acoustic optic modulator. And, it, and then all we need to do is control the, the uh, frequency and phase of that difference frequency with, which we do with a microwave oscillator. In some sense, it, it simplifies the problem of controlling the relevant phase that, that affects the qubits. So if we choose the frequency such that it, such that it equals the spin-flip frequency, then we, 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 we can induce the rotation operators, one of the fundamental, sing, the fundamental single gate operator that we need to do to, to do general quantum computations. I'll say a little bit uh, about two ion gates, more streamlined two ion gates, but just to remind you, I think most people know that one nice thing in atomic systems, not just ions, is that we can find uh, particular transitions, so-called cycling transitions, where we can take a, another laser and scatter light such that the ion has to always, always by selection rules, always returns to the, to the so-called bright state, the, the, the state that scatters a lot of of these photons, if we have this cycling transition, uh, then we can, if we only detect a few, we can efficiently detect which, uh, which spin state the ion is in. And the idea here, this is meant to indicate that, that we, there's not much scattering, very little scattering off of the so-called spin-up state in this view graph. Okay, so the, 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 the scheme that Serac and Zoller laid out is it, 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 it's kind of a stepwise way to do gates. So we, most of the groups now, we think about there's a more streamlined way to do, but I don't want to take any way, thing away from Serac and Zoller. We still use the motion, that is, we couple the ions through their motional modes. Uh, but there, are, there is a more streamlined way to do that. And just to give you an idea 
I apologize to you, to, to, to those of you who have seen me talk before because I've beaten this slide to death, but I think it's, it's, it, is, it has been become sort of the workhorse uh, gate for, for ions. And the basic idea is that, uh, is that well, if we think about the, the, the phase space for this selected motional mode that we select by tuning the frequency, or in the case of the Raman transition, the difference frequency of the, of the laser beams, then uh, we know that if we displace the wave function, Wigner function, whatever you want to talk about in phase space, and we go around a closed loop, then the, this, this component, this, this wave function will pick up phase shift uh, is proportional to the closed area. And so to make a non-trivial gate then, we, uh, we want to make this force uh, be, depend on the, on the state of the, uh, in, the, in the simplest case, the two ions that we're trying to make a gate with. And the way we do that is with, you can think about optical dipole forces. So the, the picture we develop is, say, for the simplest case is for two ions. Uh, so suppose we have laser beams such that we're only going to, there only be, a f they will only address, only be affected by the, m the modes of two ions along the axis connecting them. So the two modes that we have to think about are the center mass where they move together and the so-called stretch mode where they move in opposition. And so what we do is we take, in this case of uh, where we use two laser beams, we we actually drive Raman trend, or one way to view this process is that we we tune the frequency so that it's very close to, in this example here, very close to this stretch mode frequency. Uh, and I'll explain why it's slightly detuned in just a second. The, uh, but and one way to view, one way to explain this problem is you can think again about Raman transitions, and now instead of between. The, the spin levels is just Raman transitions between these various motional levels. A simpler way to, to view this is, in fact, uh, or, or usually is explained in terms of, of stark shifts and optical dipole forces. So what you can think about are these two laser beams that are crossed in such a way. They make a they make a, 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 a an intensity gradient that sweeps across the uh, the ions, and we adjust the positions. Uh, the spacing between the ions so that so that if the ions are in the same state, the force they feel is the same. It turns out for the particular transitions we use in beryllium, one of our favorite logic ions, is that the, in that example, the, the forces uh, are, for the two spin states are, 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 are different and, and uh, have opposite signs. So anyway, the, 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 the short of this is that we, we arrange the spacing and the, and the uh, forces on the ions so that the, so that the ions, if for the general, a general wave function of the internal states of the two ions, the, the only states that feel this excitation due to this, this, uh, this, this laser dipole force are the spin up and or the, the, the down up and up down states. So the, the p picture we develop is that for the, a component of the wave function that includes those two, those two states, uh, uh, those two states, uh, because of this slight detuning, we, as we turn on these laser beams, what happens in phase space is that the the, uh, if the if the ion, if that mode started in the ground state, it goes around a loop in phase space, and we adjust the conditions so that these so that the, these components of the wave function due to this geometrical phase uh, pick up this uh, pi over two phase shift, and the other states are are left alone. So this is the so what we call uh, this is our phase gate that uh, I think most of the labs are using now. Just to set the the state of the we were we were kind of proud of ourselves for quite a while. We had the the, uh, the best fidelity on these, and very recently the Reiner's group they've reduced the error by uh, a factor of four, and so they they've kind of broken this 99.99 uh, .99 fidelity, and uh, so we have to have to try to get back and do better than they are now. So, um, so one thing let me uh, let me just switch gears now and and say a little bit at you know, one thing we all need to worry about is memory. Um, so, uh, what, in our case, in our example of, uh, of beryllium, where we use the hyperfine energy levels for separation, what this shows is a, is a, di a diagram of the energy level separations versus magnetic field. Uh, this separation for beryllium corresponds to about 1.25 gigahertz at zero field. 
That turns out, one, a detail is that it turns out it's very easy for us to prepare states using optical pumping in either this state or this state here. And typically, well, often we've used this particular one down here. And then the, the relevant qubit transition is one up here. So this would be spin down and this would be spin up. The problem you see with this qubit, uh, this choice of energy levels for the qubit is that there's a strong magnetic field uh, sensitivity uh, for the energy separation between these two qubit levels. I should have said, I should have prefaced this by saying, and I, I mentioned it before, but the, the nice thing about the hyperfine levels is that the radiative lifetime is, is extremely long. It, it literally is on the order of the age of the universe for these low frequency transitions. Uh, so we don't have to worry about radiative time, but clearly because of this field dependent, we have to worry about the, the, the phase decoherence of the qubits due to the say an ambient magnetic field fluctuation. So in the typical experiments, we're limited to about, we have uh, on the order of a few milligauss fluctuations. And in this example here, if the field steps by a, a, a one milligauss, then the, the, in a random way, then the, the qubits DQ here in about 75 microseconds. So we have to like, as, of course, we borrow as much as we can from, for example, NMR. Uh, we have to use spin echoes to, to reverse these, uh, these, these, these decohering, uh, the effects of these decohering magnetic fields. And we do that. So most experiments we have done have, have worked around this, uh, this uh, fast decoherence due to fluctuating fields using spin echoes. Uh, another choice, though, might be is that we could use this so-called clock transition, this this MF equals zero to MF equals zero transition, which it, as the field approaches towards zero, you can see the slopes of these, these energy levels are becoming horizontal, so we, we become more immune to the, to the magnetic field effects. On the other hand, to, we need some finite magnetic field to separate out, out these levels so that we don't dry, drive the other transitions off resonantly. Uh, so we're still stuck with a, with a, with a linear a component that has linear field dependence there. And so, so one of the tricks we can do is in, in our lab with beryllium, we can, if we come out here to about 120 gauss, it turns out that there's a, there's a place for this, these particular uh, energy levels. You can see where the slopes of the, the uh, energy levels versus magnetic field are equal. And so even with these situations here, we would predict a phase decoherence of a and in fact, in the experiments we we, we can go from this 75 millisecond about 10 seconds when we go to these field independent points. So this is sort of a so a, a passive way to, to, to help with this problem of phase decoherence. As I said, the, the, it, it looks like phase decoherence is the main problem for us, particularly with these hyperfine transitions, because the, because the, life, the, the, the T1 times are so extremely long. So we still we have to work other ways, too. There's other problems in addition to magnetic fields. For example, when we do this phase gate that I mentioned, we, there are stark shifts due to the fact that, that uh, in addition to the phase gate we implement, there's also stark shifts, uh, uh, differential stark shifts between the, the, two, uh, the, 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 the two qubit levels. And, um, so there's, we need to find a way around that. And one way we do is, is also, it's a, it's a borrow, the basic idea is borrowed from uh, Anna Moore. It's a, it's a spin echo technique. And so the idea is that, cause, so here is a, it, this would be a general input to these phase gates, and of course we want to, this was the thing I explained before, we want to realize a, a, a situation where these, these uh, components of opposite spin pick up this, this uh, I phase factor. Uh, and and the, so the way we do it is we simply divide up the, the two parts of the gate. So we do one half of the phase gate, that is we go around a smaller loop to pick up a, 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 a pi over four phase shift, uh, and then we do a, a then we f do a the spin echo. We, we do a 180 degree pulse, and then we do the other half of the phase gate, uh, which generates the state we want. And then we we simply flip the spins back. And the and the idea that and what what that does is if we have stark shifts that are com 
common to both parts of the of the phase gate, then the fact that we've done this pi pulse in between cancels those effects out. So it works not only for magnetic fields, but it, uh, that might fluctuate uh, throughout the gate, but also it, it, it helps to cancel out these stark shifts. Okay, so another thing we do, and we haven't done very much yet, but where uh, uh, so far our group and, and Reiner Blatt's group are are starting to play with these DFS states. Again, we don't. We maybe don't need, well, maybe with luck we won't need to do full error correction if we can, if we're only bothered by phase decoherence. So, so simple logical qubits then are just ones that, where the, where the logical uh, spin up and spin down states uh, would persist the same if there's some sort of phase decoherence. And uh, so we've done some experiments along those lines. And in fact, uh, Reiner Blot and his group, by putting their ions back into the ground state, they can see on the order of 20 second lifetimes for these DFS qubits. And the ones that I mentioned before, we literally go from, from, uh, th from 75 microsecond uh, decoherence times to on the order of uh, 5 to 10 seconds uh, simply by encoding in these, these DFS states. So. Uh, and the, uh, oh, the other nice thing is that the, it turns out it, it, with some small minor changes, we can still do one-step logic gates. They work essentially the same way as I described for the physical qubits if we work in these DFS uh, uh, basis states. Okay, so the, the one thing I swept under the rug there is that the, the problem is that in order for these Raman transitions, for us to, to do a coherent stimulated Raman transition, uh, I mean, we say, you know, the typical verbiage is we say there's, there's a virtual state up here. Well, in fact, there's a real amplitude of this, of, of the, that couples, pardon me, there's a real uh, coupling to these states, so there's a real amplitude corresponding to these states as we do this transition. And in fact, we can get spontaneous emission due to this small component uh, of this of the excited states that we couple to. So we have to worry about th those can cause decoherence. So we spent a lot of time thinking about that. But it turns out that, that Rayleigh scattering, that is, if we scatter photons that uh, 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 that, that have the same frequency uh, as the input. Photons, so this applies to say one of the laser beams of the of the Raman pair. Uh, since we can't distinguish which ion or which state scattered the the photons, it turns out this this Rayleigh scattering doesn't uh, so doesn't bother. So it's not the total scattering that's affected; it's the so-called spontaneous Raman scattering, where the spontaneous scattering causes the ions to change state. And so we did an experiment, and the the basic result is if we if we tune away these are these lines here are, indicate where the laser beams, one of the laser beams is resonant with one of these fine structure levels. If we tune away from those conditions, the, the total scattering uh, it may be given, is given by some value, but the, 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 the spontaneous Raman scattering, which causes a decoherence, can be highly suppressed if we tune away. So, so we're able to, to utilize this this difference between Rayleigh and Raman scattering to help suppress the errors. The, the good news is, I, well, is, is just what I said, is if that we can suppress the, 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 the Raman scattering, spontaneous Raman scattering rate, uh, say, relative to the Rabi frequency that drives these, these, these two photon transitions, that goes as one over uh, the, the overall detuning from these fine structure levels squared. On the other hand, the overall rate goes as one of this detuning squared. And so the bad part of it is that we need, need more laser power. So uh, in order to get, say, default tolerance levels about 10 to minus 4, we, we, need, we do need more laser power. And it's not, I mean, it's not a hideous amount, but it's certainly more than we have right now in the lab. Okay, so we, uh, let me say a little bit about scaling up. The, I, I think, you know, uh, uh, we, in, in these traps, although I've just shown traps that store a small number of ions, in fact, we can see crystals up to a million ions in, in these, in these well-defined crystals. The problem is that 
um, in the original Serac and Zoller scheme and this phase gate scheme that I described, the, the, the problem is that we need, we ideally like to isolate one mode of motion spectrally. And the, you can start to see the problem here. So this just shows if we try to, this is, this center line here corresponds to when, in the case of a Raman transition where the difference frequency of the Raman beams is equal to just the spin flip frequency without changing the motion. And as we tune that, the difference frequency around, we see these other, these other absorption lines and what these correspond to, for example, well, this feature labeled A corresponds to the, to the case where we, uh, in this, this, this higher frequency corresponds to when we flip the spin and also change the motional quantum number for the center mass bone, my plus one. But we see all these other lines, and in fact, we see some lines where we not only, in this case, change the B mode by plus one, we lower the, the center mass mode by, by one quantum. And the problem is that, that, that we start to overlap with these lines that we don't want to see. And you can see this is just for four ions, so if we had a 10,000 ions, it would be hopeless. The spectrum would become so dense. So, so what I think what all of us are thinking about in the ion business is that somehow we'll probably need to make some arrays where we have a relatively small number of ions in any given zone uh, to be able to, 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 to not have any too, too many modes so that we can select them when we want. I mean, one, one idea and we and other labs are pursuing is to, to actually move ions around to be able to do gates on the particular ones we want. We select them out using sort of quasi-static electric potentials on these segmented electrodes, which I just saw in this cartoon here. Uh, there's other ways to do it. Uh, uh, Chris Monroe is starting experiments now where he's able to, uh, by, by, in, by using a, a scattering where he entangles the scattered photons with states of internal ions and then, then projects out uh, uh, those combines those two scattered photons uh, on a beam splitter, and he can project out entanglement between separate locations. But also, I think he, he also thinks about these arrays, that is, we still want to be able to do local gates with a small number of ions. So we probably need, in any case, we if over long times, we'll need, some, we'll need some way to freeze the motion out. Now, to do laser cooling, which is the standard thing, uh, that it requires a lot of dissipation, so we kill the qubits that way. So we typically think about having some other ion species. In our experiments on beryllium, we use magnesium, which freezes out the motion of the ions, say, before we do a gate on them. So this is the basic scheme we all are thinking about. So the other, the other, another experimental detail is that the, the typical gate, the gate speeds, uh, well, I think in all cases you can say they're proportional to the motional frequencies. The motional frequencies in these ion traps, all other parameters being the same, go as one over the dimensions of the, of the internal dimensions of these the separation of electrodes, for example. So uh, as we get smaller, we, we need some other way. We can't use conventional machining, and we've tip, we and other groups have, have used, for example, gold plating on, on alumina electrodes. Alumina is a good uh, electrode material to avoid uh, dielectric loss. And uh, so we, we mimic this electrode, this idealized quadrupole electrode structure with these type of structures here. So what I show in this diagram is some gold-plated uh, alumina electrodes which are meant to mimic these different sections of this idealized structure. We sandwich two of these together with a spacer that I don't show here to, to try to, to, to realize this more idealized quadrupole structure. So just in our lab, this, this shows our kind of our work over the last uh, three years or so, and that is this, this shows a, a case where we're starting to be able to make these array and this arrays. In this case, it's only an array along the, a, a, a single axis. Uh, in this case, this particular example, we have separate zones located above each one of these segments here. Uh, and in fact, we can do we can start to invoke some some simple uh, 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 quantum communication or computation protocols, and these are some of the things we've done in our lab. Uh, of course, you know what? In the end, the way we we make our way in the world is we we, we you know we. It's nice to see these effects, these these basic effects, but in fact, uh, as any other 
lab is, uh, you know, we only do things well enough to see the effect and the, their fidelity and all these things we've done is actually pretty poor. So we need to, clearly we need to do a lot better on these operations. And I come back to the, the busy slide with all the math on it. it, 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 it it's, uh, as far as we know, it's just a matter of working on the details, controlling laser power, et cetera, things like that, to improve the fidelity of these operations. So one thing we, uh, coming back to this idea of making a, a trap array, uh, that this two-dimensional structure that I've shown where, uh, or rather three-dimensional structure, these two layers that are sandwiched together, uh, I mean, it's just hard to make. Uh, if I go back very briefly to this picture here, uh, I, well, uh, this doesn't show it well, so well, but anyway, we, we have to hold this thing together with, we couldn't find a good glue that would work in vacuum and avoid RF loss, so we literally had to bolt these things together with tiny screws. So one of the things we, we, we and other groups have been doing is trying to simplify the structure. And if we think about this idealized quadrupole structure on end, so these are these four rods and we're looking down the axis of the system. It turns out we can dis distort these electrodes into a plane and we still get uh, a trapping area above this plane of the electrode. So this, the, the yellow lines here are the electric field lines for the, um, for this particular trap structure. And the, and, the, and the selling point here, the attraction of this a way to make the devices is that it's much easier to, to, to lay down electrodes in a plane than it is to build these 3D structures. So this shows a few examples. The, uh, th this shows a couple of ours, and uh, Ike Chuang at MIT has also made some surface traps uh, 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 along the same basic ideas. Uh, 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 DTO uh, 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 helped fund some work, separate work at Lucent and Sandia to make uh, some of these devices with the idea of, of, of large scaling in mind. But anyway, I think we feel we're on the track to, uh, to, to, to making something useful with, these, uh, with this surface electrode geometry. This shows a, a trap uh, that we're working on in our lab that the, the, we, we uh, of course, the, the, you know, not, I wouldn't impress any condensed matter uh, person, but it's, the, the atomic physicists are usually, usually impressed by the idea that you can, if you make one trap, you can make lots at the same time because of the number of steps in this, this, this lithographic method of construction are, are, are the same. And so this shows an example. It's actually, it's a trap that exists, but, but before trying this, we tried to, we, we decided to step off a, or step back a little bit and use a, make a trap with a smaller section of this, which, which is now wor working. The, the key difference in this one versus what I showed before is this, this actually, although the electrodes all lie in a plane, this one has electrodes that uh, allow us to, for example, connect this electrode and, and route a connection wire underneath these other electrodes uh, in order to be able to, to to be able to bias the electrodes inside this 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 ring structure um, so anyway we 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 feel anyway we're, we're we're hopefully along the way to 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 being able to make these larger structures um, okay so but, uh, another reality of these ion traps and one that's plagued all the labs for for many years is that uh, I show just in cartoon form the, in the idealized structure is that um, what we see is well for just to back up if I didn't really emphasize but in these in these gates that we do whether it's the Serac and Zoller version or the uh, this one this phase gate where we can kind of do the whole gate in one step uh, the the uh, the ideal the ideal situation is where the we freeze out all the motion and then we go around this loop in phase space, but the ion in phase space returns back to the ground state. Well, uh, uh, one thing we one problem we fight against is if there's any sort of heating that is fluctuating electric fields in which you can heat the motion, and if that hurt, occurs during the gate, obviously it compromises the fidelity of the gates. And the thing that's plagued all the labs 
uh, ever since we really started making these small devices is that we, we know there's some sort of heating and the worst part is we don't really know what it is. Uh, but uh, a model that seems to have developed is that, that if that is, the, is one where if we assume we have some sort of unspecified patch potentials that are randomly fluctuating and, and what seems to fit the data, I'll show you in a sec here, but uh, at least approximately is that uh, if the patches are small compared to the distance to the, to the ion, from, the ion distance from, uh, between the ion and the electrode, excuse me, uh, then the, this heating rate would go as one over dimension squared, that is the, the overall scaling of the and we roughly see that, that as I say, the, the embarrassing part is we don't know what this is. Uh, uh, but so, we, and one thing I'll try to indicate here in the next view graph is that probably we need better processing methods and better materials. And it, it's now starting to seem that low temperature helps. So one way to express this is a compilation of heating results from from various labs uh, over roughly the last 10 years or so and this shows this one over d to the fourth scaling so even though there's wide error bars it seems to to fit better to that than one over d squared which would be as if we just had uh, a noise that was common to us to a particular electrode uh, and the, 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 there's a couple of things to point out about this graph. We, we, I haven't expressed it in, uh, I've expressed it in term, one way to normalize to the different, since it depends on the mass of the ions and the oscillation frequency, we can normalize that by, by calculating the electric field spectral density that causes the heating we see. And that's, so that's what I've plotted on the left side here. Uh, but a couple of things to note is this, this is actually some early results from our lab and uh, you can see the, the, the heating rate, uh, somehow we were able to make this go down, but why we don't know. So it turns out this was exactly the same trap and all we did was do a, some different vacuum processing. But what it seems to say then is that, that, that when we do our vacuum processing for these traps, we have to be very, very wary of Contaminants that might get in uh, get in the system to, to to cause this variation in results. The most uh, uh, one of the most interesting things recently is that starting with Chris Monroe uh, a year or two ago, uh, they they started to cool their apparatus down, and you can see they got some points that were uh, were significantly below this 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 nominal line. We can try through the other data. And more recently, uh, like Chong's group, they've gone to 4 Kelvin and they see a substantial lowering of this heating rate. So probably we're, at least most of us are thinking about low temperature. It's still obviously, it's still be nice to understand what the root causes of this is, is but, but maybe we can be helped along. Uh, maybe we won't have to understand it perfectly if we can, can go to low temperature. Now we've actually known about this forever, that, that it'd be nice for a number of to go to, to low temperature. The reason we haven't is that it, it, it just complicates the, the, the experimental setups, getting laser beams in and out, of, in and out of a cryogenic apparatus is, is painful, and uh, that's why we haven't done it. The, the, it, it, it the, there's certainly this evidence, though, that it now suppresses the, this anomalous noise, this patch noise, fluctuating patch. Uh, noise heating, and of course it also uh, suppresses the thermal noise, the, the Johnson noise in any resistance in the, any of the electrode materials. Um, and in fact, actually we, we have an experiment not on quantum computing, but one of our clock experiments is, uh, uh, um, is at liquid helium, and we had a particular problem there. All the ions we're using, unfortunately, the, they're, they're susceptible to chemical reactions with background gas. So all the ions we're using, unfortunately, they're ones that when the qubit ion is in the excited state, it'll, it'll react with uh, molecular hydrogen, which is usually the dominant background gas in a well-prepared room temperature apparatus, and, and the ions go away, which is bad. One thing we noticed with mercury ions is that in this clock experiment is that the, the it also had these chemical reaction problems, and the lifetime literally went when, when we went from room temperature to uh, to 4 Kelvin in that apparatus, the lifetime literally went from 10 minutes to 6 months. So we, we basically freeze out all the, all the 
all these harmful gases in the vacuum system. So that's good as, as well. So there's, there's certainly some big pluses, it appears, about going to low temperature, and if we can mix the experiments a little harder, but I suspect that that's maybe where we'll end up going. Let me just, I want to conclude by saying this a little bit off subject, but then I'll come back to some application that we've derived from this, this, uh, this application of quantum information processing to metrology. Now in our group at, at NIST, we're, uh, our main mission related work is to make atomic clocks and we use atomic ions to do that. So one of the things that we, one of the, uh, just to give you an example, the, one, of the, one of our potentially favorite clock ions is this, to use a, a aluminum ion and these days clock, uh, atomic clocks uh, to get in the game, you want to think about optical transitions. That is where you drive a transition, uh, synchronize an optical, uh, pardon me, a laser to an optical transition, and then you count cycles of the optical radiation. So this is an example of that. It turns out that aluminum has some nice properties in terms of its immunity from external fields and so on. So, but the problem is, I mentioned that earlier on that we, for example, in the most atomic experiments, the way we detect states is we use this state-dependent uh, scattering. It turns out that there is a corresponding transition in aluminum, which I don't show here, but it's well into the UV where it's impossible to get a, a laser. So what we've, what we've done is use, uh, coming back to the Serac and Zoller scheme, we use one of the simple ideas in their scheme, and that is if we simultaneously, simultaneously store this clock ion, the aluminum, and then our favorite qubit ion in the same trap, then uh, when, we, when, when, we, when we drive, the, when we probe the clock transition, this aluminum transition, in general after turning on and off the laser, then this, if we're near resonance, this is in some superposition state. So what we do is we map, we freeze out the motion, then we map this superposition state onto one of the motional modes, and then map that onto the beryllium ion, which we can easily detect via this laser scattering. Um, and this has a lot of nice features. I won't be able to go through all those, but uh, uh, just one is that, for example, it turns out the beryllium is much more sensitive to electric and magnetic fields than the aluminum, and we can use that to calibrate the, is that, is that five, sorry? Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, we can use that to, to calibrate the, the, the electric and magnetic fields that the, that the aluminum ion sees. Um, one thing we're kind of proud of, and again, this is a little off the subject here, but we're really proud of is that this, we've now, with this clock and also this mercury clock that I mentioned, we're, we're now getting down to where the systematic uncertainties are, are uh, at roughly at this level, and that's about, that's an order of magnitude lower than the best any other uh, clocks that exist at this point. Let me come back though to this, uh, a little bit more to quantum information processing that, that we actually, that we utilize in this clock and that is the, the following that, that it turns out um, we didn't, we, we, I mentioned earlier on on the busy slide with all the math is that the, um, one of the problems that affects the fidelity of the state transfer of the gates in general is that if the other modes have, are thermally excited, that you know from shot to shot that smears out the the uh, the rate of transfer, the Rabi rates in these tran in these transfer sets that we do. And in this particular experiment, we didn't freeze out the motion in all these other modes. Uh, and in fact, that that meant that the fidelity of our measurement through this transfer process for one for one measurement was only about 85%, but it turns out that this process, this mapping and detection process doesn't affect the, the, uh, the, 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 the probabilities of the, of the aluminum ion, and in this case the aluminum qubit of being in one state or the other. So, we, it, so, this, so this mapping process and the detection is a, is a QND process, so we can repeat it, and in fact we can, we can we can, uh, from this rather poor detection of fidelity, by repeating this process, we can get up to over three-ninths uh, detection fidelity. And since I'm running short on time, oh, the, the other thing I want to say is that I think most people know is that this is also not only detection, but if we if we can use this to 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 uh, to also. Uh, at, to prepare states, that is, we do this re repetitive detection on which state we're in to prepare state. 
And let me not go, this is a little busy, but let me just say we can, we can uh, without going through the deals, let me just try to summarize, we can, we can actually extend this somewhat, and we've shown so far we can do it at least for, so in this, in this context here, think about the aluminum ions being qubits, uh, and here's our beryllium ion. We can actually, there's a selective way to do the mapping where we can, we can distinguish the states of the different aluminum qubits by doing this repetitive mapping and detection. And for this problem, with, even with all its imperfections, we can get to a, an error rate of about a little lower than 2% on this multiple qubit uh, readout. So uh, the, the one nice thing is actually, the, the, at least we're, we're happy to say is that we're actually using some of these simple ideas of the, in this case, the mapping and the, the uh, QND detection, and, and, and they're routinely used in this clock experiment. The other thing to come back to, I mentioned in this, in this idea of, of using arrays of ions, we think we'll need some sort of other refrigerator ion to keep the ions cold before we do gates. And what's nice about that is that these refrigerator ions can be used for this purpose of detection and this, this uh, multiple QND detection to enhance the, the, the detection sensitivity. So with that, let me uh, let me just summarize here. The, so uh, in some sense, we've we've been able to demonstrate all of the the required elements. That is this list that Dave Vincenzo put out early on. But I have to again say that we don't do it with nearly good enough detection. Uh, fidelity. So I think all the labs, we all have to work on the grungy problems, controlling laser intensity, things like that. Uh, I, I think all the labs too are, are, are trying to find ways to develop these multi-zone traps so that we can scale up to, to larger numbers. I've uh, just in this last couple of viewgrass indicated how we can take some of these simple ideas of quantum information processing and apply it to metrology, in our case clocks. Uh, again, uh, it's worth emphasizing that we're maybe roughly at this level now. We've got a long way to go to get to anywhere near what we might consider for, for fault tolerant operation. And, but as far as we know, we just we have, to, we have to do a lot better job of controlling, engineering, things like that. Uh, one of the, one of the I, obviously there's lots of problems, there's lots of uh, control issues as we scale the number of ion trap zones up, uh, just making the connections, things like that. We need to, to multiplex the laser beams in a, in a larger array. One of the things, at least I think we're tending to focus on in the, in the near term future is being able to do, do simultaneous detection in multi, or, or rather different zones of this array. Right now we use conventional optic, optics, big lenses, big fancy lenses that will only look in one place. And so we maybe have to go to some sort of fiber detection, something like that. So this is one of the things we're working on. Um, so anyway, so just very briefly, I mean, I, I obviously, like everybody else, it'd be nice to get to more qubits. And, I mean, a, as an example, maybe a nice algorithm to be able to do is full and repetitive error correction, keep a qubit alive for essentially indefinitely. And uh, maybe maybe we'll even make a useful device. And I, I say or not down here because I mean I think one of the interesting thing that always comes up in our subject is this business about decoherence. And and maybe we'll get lucky. And as we build larger and larger uh, arrays of entangled qubits, maybe we'll be able to shed some light on this problem, a, a fundamental decoherence problem. So with that, I'll stop. Thanks. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Yeah. Like to get an, an arbitrary um, qubit gate, you rely on combining these space gates with military operations, or right, right. So the, the I mean the well, well, you know, I'm sure as well as I that, that at least 
at least one strategy to take is that you could, if you can do the rotations and this one form of gate, you could do universal computations. I mean, I mean, clearly it may not be the most efficient way, but at least you could do that. And I didn't mention it at all, but we can, uh, we can extend this phase gate to work on multiple ions as well. But uh, so there's. So it doesn't have to be just in terms of these these simple two gates, but we could do it that way. But the reason I presented it that way is just that whatever, even with the kind of special gates that we might use for on, on multiple ions, the technical problems are are the same. You know? So if we can beat down these technical problems just working on the simple gates, will go a long way to doing the more general gates. Well, the theorists have to tell me, but I mean, I think in early on in the game, that you know, they, DiVincenzo, I forget who all was involved, uh, showed that you know, if yeah, you can go, you can combine this simple. Oh well, with the I didn't really talk about the rotations, but in principle, we can do arbitrary angles now to do universal computation. You know, you need a much more limited. Dis set of discrete gates in principle, but with this technique in principle, we can do arbitrary angles. So. Yes. Yes, and we haven't done a very systematic or good job of that yet, but that's sort of all in the works. And for example, we're starting to do pre and post analysis with SEM to try to get an idea what the surfaces might be doing. And and probably all, all those, I mean, the things you're thinking about are all good suggestions and um, we're on our way, but we haven't done a ne nearly a good enough job yet to try to, to, to root out what, what might be going on there. Yeah. What is the magnetic field there? You said that there were field fluctuations on the order of gas. How big is the field and how far are you stabilizing the magnetic field? Um, okay, yeah, good good technical question. Actually the this is one of the things we don't do a very good job on. In fact what we're what we're bothered by is sixty hertz and harmonics from all the stuff in the lab and and so far we haven't done um, we haven't done any passive stabilization of the field. I mean, obvious thing is to use magnetic shields, and we haven't done that. The re Again, the reason, we, or in a similar way that was I indicating with some of these other problems, the reason I haven't done it is it's just it's hard to get magnetic shields around this thing, and we've got all these lenses that are trying to poke laser beams in. But it's it's an obvious thing to do, and we're starting to do that, but we haven't done a very good job yet. So. Uh, well, for these, these field-independent qubits that I mentioned, those are at 120 gauss, which sort of precludes the normal shielding. For the other experiments, it's only a few gauss, so we can do more conventional shielding, for example, with, with new metal, things like that. So, and, but we haven't done that yet. So.